Well, I think one of the things I'm going to be talking about this evening is the fact that 25 years ago, and it seems on one level a million years ago, and just like yesterday in other levels, a group of New York people, now young, older than students, but people in their early 30s, etc., confronted the AIDS crisis and said, what are we going to do about it? And we were not captains of industry. Um, many of us ran art galleries and smaller organizations. And we found that putting the smarts that we had learned from our educations and our jobs, to a certain degree, I suppose, from our upbringings, we could made a change. And we, in fact, created an event, which happens today, this being the 25th convening of A Day Without Art, that even in its first year was touched by 750 museums across North America. And by the last year that I was intimately involved, about 1996, we were touching hundreds of millions of people across the world. And it shows you that if you have energy, if you're creative, and you learn the conduits of your world, you can achieve anything. 25 plus years ago, I was called to do grand jury duty. And in New York then, back then, it was 30 days, half a day, and I would schlep down to Lower Manhattan. And I noticed at the end of my time that there was a lot of activity going down in Lower Manhattan because it was going to be the first parade um, uh, circa 1990 of the soldiers coming back from the first Gulf War. And you saw a lot of old duffers on the subway wearing what to me amounted to being corsages. And I thought, this is strange. This doesn't seem to be normative. And then, of course, it struck me this was the combination of that song, tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree, sort of country and western schlocky song. But that people, when the, the soldiers went away to the Gulf War, they were tying ribbons around their trees. And there were images on the newscasters. And I came back and I said to the group, when we were then a couple of years into it, and I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get some kind of symbol similar to that corsage that people would be willing to put on just to identify themselves. I wear this, I care. And so we had a group of artists working with our organization, Visual Aids, and we said, well, you're the artist, you take it up. And at the next meeting, um, a couple of the artists uh, were there from this larger caucus, and I remember the artist, um, Hope Sandro came in and she showed the red ribbon, the curl cue with the gold pin through it. And I remember I said, oh, I thought it's tacky. Everyone else liked it. So he said, okay, group decision, let's go with it. And the rest is history. Symbols are very important. That we see someone wearing a symbol, whether it's a political button or the Nike swoosh, and we immediately expect something of them because we have a sense of what that swoosh or Citibank logo means. And I think as soon as students begin to see that by creating those, they can really mark themselves in important ways. I mean, one thinks of uh, the yellow star that was put on uh, Jews during the, the Second World War to be a symbol of ignominy. And when other people took those stars up and said, we will wear them as well. It was not just a decorative gesture, it was not just a palliative gesture, but it was one that had a great deal of uh, danger inherent in it. Um, I think, you know, the red ribbon, which I'm gonna talk about, when it started out, it was something new, and it was shocking to some people, oddly as that may seem. Now it's not, and I think what people today, if they're concerned, because someone said to me uh, when I gave a talk similarly a few months ago, what should we do? And I said, that's not up to me. That's up to you. It's up to your world, your generation, what you think needs to be done to make your world a better place, and what makes you fearful and angry. Because I think ultimately it's those kinds of base emotions, if you want to call them that, that give us a clarion call to action. As active as many AIDS groups were, in the, the time, the first years of the most horrific years, at least in North America, in Western Europe, for the AIDS crisis, a lot of that is simmered down. I remember someone calling me not so long ago and saying, does uh, the group ACT UP even exist anymore? And it turned out there were small nests of it around the country who would meet, but they weren't staging anything. So I would sort of answer your question in a, a sort of bifurcated way to say, I mean, there's not much activism going on today. And in fact, I think there's a lot of incipient activism happening in places in Asia, 
in Africa, in South America, where the numbers of uh, viral conversion of infection with HIV are happening at a far, far greater rate than they are in this country. And I think one thing is that it's rather shocking to think that only 25 years later and some young people, I mean young people are invincible and think they're never going to get ill, what have you, and that's part of the joy of youth. But to think that um, this happened and many of us worked hard to get people to be aware of it um, and they're going back to some of the same practices um, that they did before when no one knew how the virus was spread. There's always a sense of a group getting together who's passionate and thinking that they have the only one answer. I mean, I suppose you could say that Visual AIDS was one group and the other one at the time was ACT UP and one remembers them for their street actions and some really wonderful art-related activist work. They felt sometimes, because they were out in the streets, sort of with fists raised, etc., that we were wimps because we were working institutionally. But I think that one of the things I used to say all the time, and I would, re 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 what do you call it, uh, reiterate it today, was the fact of it was one thing and an important thing to talk about issues for the gay community in big urban areas like New York and San Francisco, because that was the community that was being hit. But that community knew about AIDS. Other places across the world didn't. It couldn't be spoken about. It still can't be spoken about in some law firms and some businesses. So we thought to provide the larger world with something that they could accommodate and yet could stand out. And I think it's like anything else. I mean, one, the one thing we did learn, I think, the biggest tactic that we learned in our years of working was the fact that rather than say, do it. We said, pick something that you will do, uh, whether it's passive or more active, but do it in a context that suits its community. So perhaps communities of color, communities where the first language wasn't English, religious communities. The Chinese community uh, always speaks of the dead to say that these people have died, and it doesn't matter that they died due to HIV-related uh, causes, they still died, and they still should be remembered as part of family and as part of community and as part of history. And that disease, or the way that, in which the disease um, uh, started, should not be a, a deterrent to that community embrace.